Jesus. Great is your faithfulness. Holy Spirit, open your word to us. Help us to hear, to receive from you this evening. To your glory and praise and to the welfare of our souls, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Murder and mayhem in the streets, anger, hatred. We're living at a time when it's difficult, isn't it? To say the least, very hard. At the same time as we, we face what's happening in our nation right now, we also have been living with a pandemic for many weeks. This all comes together almost in a perfect storm. Pandemic, health concerns, lockdowns, mass, and it goes on and on. And then protests and rioting and physical assault. What's going on? Is there a word from the Lord in this time in which we live? And I would submit to you, yes, there is a word from the Lord. And we want to consider something of that word tonight as we look to what God is saying to us. This message is titled, Christ for the Crises. Crises, plural. We have different crises that we're dealing with. I want to look at just three of them briefly this evening. First of all, a crisis of the heart. A crisis of the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. We read there, For the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? For the heart, the heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked 
in Jeremiah, the heart stands for the character of a man, the character of a woman. So when he says here, the heart is deceitful, he's talking of the, the basic character of a person. It's wicked because of the fall of Adam, we all inherit a wicked character, if you will. But notice in the verse, the question is asked, who can know it? Who can know the heart of a person? Who can know the true character of a person? And the implication is that it's God. God knows your heart, your character. God knows my heart, my character. God knows what's happening in the life of every person. He knows the character. Character is a precious, precious commodity. There is a judge in Michigan, his name is Raymond Vogt. He runs a, a very tight ship in his courtroom. He says to the people when they come into his courtroom, there will be no devices left on. You have to turn off your devices, don't want to hear any sound. And he said, if you disobey that, you're going to be held in contempt of court and you're going to have to pay a fine. Tough character. Well, don't you suppose the good judge holding court heard a phone ring and it was his own smartphone. Disturbed the proceedings. He had to stop the proceedings took a recess, and during that time, he held himself in contempt of court and fined himself $25. And then the court resumed. Now, I would submit to you that's character. When a man has integrity, when a man, a woman, is willing to admit failings, sins, and judge himself or herself. Character. Character is, as D.L. Moody once said, character is what a man is in the dark when no one else sees. Character. And today we have a crisis of character. Yes, it's out there in our culture, but it's also in the church. And we can't escape we can't escape the, the word of God to us. We are called to high character. We are called to be people who are transparent, who are authentic. We're called to be people who live what we preach, who desire to glorify the Lord with all of our strength of being. A crisis of character. But there is another crisis, a confusion of the mind. A confusion of the mind. In the scripture, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, he writes, for God is a God for God is not a God, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. In the context there, Paul is writing to the church about taking care of business in their church gatherings, that is, have things done decently and in order. Otherwise, there's going to be chaos and confusion. But I think we can also apply the, the precept to what we are seeing tonight in the great cities of our nation. Confusion reigns. There are all kinds of ideas. 
all kinds of, of thoughts. And a lot of them are at odds with one another. Whether it's politicians, whether it's local officials, whether it's religious leaders, the list could go on and on. And there's such confusion. And let me ask you, where does that confusion come from? It does not come from God, as we just read. For God is not a God of confusion. The confusion comes from the enemy of our souls, the devil itself. We need wisdom from God. We need a dependence upon the Word of God as we seek to live these days of stress and trouble. God is not a God of confusion. It's important for a church to remember that. It's also important for our nation. Another crisis, if you will, is a contribution of Satan himself. A contribution of Satan himself. We've seen a crisis of the heart, the character, also a confusion of the mind, and now a contribution of Satan himself. The first part of John chapter 10 and verse 10. For the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Or another way of putting it, for the thief comes only to steal, murder, and destroy. These few words from Jesus, talking about the false shepherds of his day, the religious leaders who were leading the precious sheep, the people of God, down the wrong path, who were fleecing the flock, giving them falsehoods, turning them away from the truth. In that context, as Jesus talks about false shepherds who are thieves who come to steal the faith of the people, to kill them, kill their souls, and to destroy their lives, we can say also that this is a description of the enemy. This is a description of Satan himself. I've thought of this verse many times in the last couple of weeks. As we look out around us, and as the news programs come to us ad nauseum, for the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's what we're seeing right now. It's not people who are the enemy. The enemy is the devil himself, Satan himself. And Satan is laughing out loud today because of all the hurt and pain and trouble he is causing our nation and indeed in other places around the world. Satan is having a heyday. But we have to come back and remember, if you're in Christ today, you don't have to fear. As Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And Christian, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. First John reminds us. A crisis of the heart. The loss of character, integrity a confusion of the mind, great confusion around. 
and then a contribution of Satan himself to fan the flames of unrest and self-righteousness and self-centeredness. Well then, is there a response to this? Is there a response that we in the church might have to what is going on around us? First of all, let me, let me preface, let me preface what I'm saying here in terms of responses to say that we need a revival. You know that, it isn't anything new. We need a revival in our churches. We need Jesus in power in our churches and our culture needs Jesus as well. He is the answer. And that's, be, that's not being simplistic, that's the truth. Where else do we go? Where else do we look? As Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life, the words of truth. You have it, Lord. In terms of responses, I think we have to begin at the response of repentance. Repentance. You remember Jesus talking to his disciples in Luke 13, called them to repentance. And I want you to note with me in Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse one, Jesus is commenting about two disasters that happened in the area. And notice what he says, Luke 13 and beginning of verse one, there were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Very strong words here from Jesus. The call to repentance comes two times to his followers, to his people in a sense. He says, when you see things happening over here where people are killed, when there is a, a disaster over here, when things are happening all around, don't become smug. Don't think that you are the fortunate to be out of harm's way. No, when you see these things happening, these tragedies taking place, what are the people of God to do, according to what Jesus says here? Except you repent, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Except you turn from your sins, leave them, search your own heart. I find I have to do that these days now, when I can find creeping up into my heart, into the flesh, various ideas, about certain people, certain situations, and I can form a whole mindset concerning what we're facing today on the streets. And it may not be entirely accurate, but Jesus says, That's not, that, that shouldn't be your concern. Your concern should be to repent, to turn. Luther in his catechism says often, repent, repent, turn, forsake, sin. 
Look at your own life. And that's the gist of it here with Jesus. Each one of us, starting with the preacher to those of you out there, it's to look within and see what, what resides within me. Is it all that honors God? Is it all that's true to his word? Or am I being affected by the newscasts and the pictures and all the rest that's going on today? Repentance. There was a man who had a hard time repenting. He would go to the altar at his church all the time and he had one prayer that he prayed. Lord, take away the cobwebs in my life. His pastor had heard that prayer many times at the altar that the man prayed. And once again, they were at the altar, this man and the pastor. And the man started in, Lord, take away the cobwebs in my life. And his pastor interrupted him and prayed, Lord, kill the spider. Kill the spider. You see, that's going deeper. That isn't superficial. Repentance is going deeper, beloved. Deeper in terms of what it is to finally be free in Jesus Christ. And living in this world that calls us to such, to such endurance today. The response of repentance. Another response. You and I, church, we are called to life. To life. I quoted John 10, 10. The first part of it earlier, I want to go to the last part now. The first part said, for the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And now the last part, Jesus says, but I, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That you might have life to the full. To the full. It's interesting, just in that verse, the first part deals with death, all the way, death. The second part, talking about Jesus, it presents life. There's such a strong contrast just in that one verse. I have come that you might have life, life to the full. We have to know that life in the church, beloved. Have we gotten complacent? Are we going through the motions? Have we faded in terms of our commitment to the Lord? Have the cares and trials and troubles of this world dulled your relationship to Christ? You see, we can't expect the world out there to have life in Jesus Christ if the church of Christ isn't alive. That's why I talk about reviving, bringing back to life a people who are hungry for God, who are sold out for God, who want his kingdom to come and nothing else. Life, life. Do you have life today? Can you testify that you know, that you know, that you know, that you have eternal life in Christ and are ready for eternity? We can't begin to help this culture if you and I are not sure of where we stand with the Lord. See, the Lord is seeking to raise up an army, an army, an army of faithful soldiers who fight not with swords and spears and not with machine guns and bombs, but an army that fights with love, the love of Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit, with a forgiving attitude, 
with wisdom from God's word. Life. Yes, we all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. There is yet another response besides repentance and the call to life. And this is the call to live in peace. Peace. Peace is not necessarily the absence of conflict. Peace in the Bible is a sense of well-being. Inward peace because there is a relationship with God that is unobstructed. Shalom, peace, well-being of the person. You remember Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Is that good? Have you had a troubled heart this week? Be honest. I have. But Jesus says to his child, his blood-washed child of God, listen, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. And notice, it's Jesus' peace. It isn't peace that is pulled out of the sky someplace. This is the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. My peace. Isn't it something that Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, would want us to have His peace filling our lives so that we can travel over the, the bumps and potholes of this road we call life? So that we can face the storms that assail us with peace in the midst of the storm because Jesus Christ is in my boat, is in your boat. And he says, peace, be still. Peace. My peace. And as an act of grace, he gives that peace to the one who needs it and believes that Jesus is indeed peace. You see, as we look upon our culture and what's happening on the streets today, there is not peace because the peacemaker has been rejected. The peacemaker has been rejected. On whatever side you want to look, Jesus Christ has been rejected. Peace in the midst of the storm. We want to be agents, channels of God's peace, don't we? To people. And we want to be praying. Praying for peace. Peace that passes all understanding. You think of our, our world today and the actual murders of people, precious lives, whether in Minneapolis or St. Louis, precious lives snuffed out and the camera caught it all as these precious lives were dying. Oh, that God would not allow us to become hardened to what we are seeing around us. Peace. A lot of people are looking for peace. Some of you may have visited the Winchester Mansion in San Jose, California. Sarah Winchester, the widow of the owner of the gun company, Winchester, 
1884, started to add on to her, shall we say, her house. And 38 years later, she stopped when she died. Every year, adding on to her place, became known as the Winchester Mansion. It had, and has, people can visit it, 10,000 windows, 160 rooms, I think about 60 bedrooms included in that. It was worth in that day what today would be about $70 million. Winchester Mansion. And people were trying to figure out why did this lady keep hiring contractors and carpenters and masons and plumbers? Why did she keep adding on to this, this mansion? Because a lot of the hallways don't go anywhere. Go to a wall. It's a hallway there, another hallway there. They don't go anywhere. Why did she keep adding on? And one theory is that she thought that by keeping the addition of things to her home, she wouldn't die. As long as she was adding things to her house, she wouldn't die. Well, I don't know just what, what her thinking was along those lines, but most agree she was seeking peace. Peace. And for her, that mansion and adding to it brought a sense of peace. Well, people seek for peace in many places, don't they? Many people, many places. But peace is only to be found in the one who is peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we look at these crises that are in real time, Oh, that God would give us a spirit of repentance, people, to make sure we're right with God so that we can speak to the culture, to those around us who have questions, who wonder about things, whether it's the pandemic or whether it's the, the violence. response of repentance, life, peace, all comes on the basis of what God says in his word, all tied in with the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Perhaps some of you are recalling D-Day. The invasion of Normandy, 76 years ago today, June 6th, 1944. The Allied troops landed on the beaches at Normandy and began to retake France from the German occupation. And it was to set in motion the the final outcome of the war, the victory later on. We lost many soldiers in that invasion of Normandy. Thousands of American soldiers died. Many, many more were wounded or maimed as they came. Why were they coming? They were coming for freedom. And may I say to you that when those soldiers, our soldiers, our brave people, landed at Normandy, there wasn't the concern whether someone was black or someone was white or someone was brown or someone was yellow. Didn't make any difference. There was only one color that shone out and it was the color red because red blood was coursing out of the veins of these Soldiers who were giving their lives so that you, can, you and I could be free today to worship. Among other things, the only color that made any difference was the red in the blood of these soldiers.
God, give us grace, wisdom, a spirit of repentance, a deeper appreciation for life in Jesus Christ, and an increasing awareness that even as the way is hard, there is peace for the sojourner in Christ. God help us to be that loving, holy, truthful witness to Jesus as we have opportunity today for the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us, your forgiveness for our sins. We're so glad we can live in that cleansing through the finished work of Jesus at the cross where he died for our sins, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Oh Lord, as we are, are looking at things around us, Lord, give us a clearer vision of the cross and what Jesus provided for us there. All of grace and all of mercy, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Will you stand with me and join together as we sing Love Lifted Me?